Well, hello folks. Um, as my mom used to always say, you should really hang around with people who are more intelligent than you because then it, some of it might rub off on you. So that's what I'm doing here, uh, here today. But first of all, let me give you my bias right up front. When I meet somebody who's a new acquaintance, sometimes they ask me, uh, Ivan, uh, where do you like, uh, or like come from like originally? Something like that. And so I say, uh, I was born in Ontario, but not near Toronto, further north, up by Georgian Bay, and then the kicker comes, I come from rural Ontario. I feel this really, this need, this, this, this obsession, I suppose, to qualify my roots as being rural. Uh, it, it kind of sets me apart from that uh, cultural sinkhole uh, sucking us into the American cultural orbit known as the GTA or the Greater Toronto Area, although the A can stand for something else uh, as well. Um, when Ontario Place first opened, Ontario Place is that architectural confusion down on the waterfront, opened in the 1970s. There was a big feature there, which was a huge IMAX theater. And they showed every day, all day, a film called North of Superior. And it was full of romantic images of rural. There were kids on inner tubes and trains and snow. And a bunch of us went on a school trip and we sat and we watched the movie eight times in a row. It were all a bunch of country bumpkins who were sitting there saying, this is great. I mean, we knew that rural was amazing. And now it seemed like even those rich big city folks you know, in, in Toronto thought that as well. So the myths of the rural have always had a strong connection with me. Now, these are myths, but I'm not alone. I mean, there, there is this kind of sense that while the economic heart of the country is in the cities, which it isn't, by the way, but that's a whole other talk, but while the economic heart is in the cities, that the soul is out past the suburbs. However, rural, I think, is more than myth because it is really rural that will save civilization. Uh, my core argument is that the skills and the innovations that we developed in our rural communities are what we need to maintain in order to survive as a species. Now the word civilization comes from Latin, which basically means living in cities. Now how will rural save civilization? Well, it created civilization. I mean, it maintains it. Uh, it's likely the only thing that can save it. I mean, civilization was only possible through rural innovation, by creating surpluses of food so that people could be non-productive and still eat. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll spare you, if you don't mind, a few anthropological musings about the history of humanity here. We, uh, we grow and we grow in terms of population. We uh, become sedentary, stay in one place. We uh, extract more and more resources from less and less land. So lots of people can be non-productive, meaning that they don't really make anything that you can uh, sit under or eat or wash your hair with. You know, people, like, people like me. Uh, and yeah, it takes some pressure, even coercion, to keep those raw materials flowing into the cities. But if the governance unit is in the city, they get to set the rules, right? So it keeps flowing. Well, then a point comes when the rural communities around there can no longer sustain the cities and they collapse, game over, start again. And slowly the rural communities start to create surpluses again and civilization then is rebuilt. Now in the midst of this, there's this stereotype that rural is not innovative. In fact, rural has been the site of the major kind of foundational institutions that make up Canada, whether it be related to medicine or education or civic life. When you really, really press a Canadian on what is it that makes you different from other countries, they might mention something like, oh, socialized medicine. Well, that came from rural Saskatchewan. Or they might say, well, it's a, it's a more communal and caring set of relations, both here at home and abroad. Well, that comes from our dense network of Fishermen's Protective Associations and Women's Institutes and municipal governments and so on that, that sprouted up across rural Canada. Because necessity breeds invention, it breeds innovation. The problems of rural, the problems of survival in rural requires innovation. Medicare was developed under Louis Saint Laurent, Prime Minister. He came from a small community, Compton, Quebec. Medicare is now being dismantled by Prime Minister Stephen Harper who grew up in Toronto. Need I say more? Yeah. My core argument is that the skills and innovations we develop in rural communities are what we need to maintain in order to survive. Now, let's look at the arts for a minute. 
this is usually an area that's seen as being emblematic of innovation. Think of musical innovation in the 20th century. What were the major musical styles and genres that developed? So things like uh, blues and country and rockabilly leading to rock, folk, of course, trad, um, gospel, roots of jazz. These are all rural innovations. You can sing bluegrass in the city if you want to, but it ain't from there. If you think of visual arts, the history of visual art in Canada is a history of an obsession with landscape. I mean, you can't swing a paddle around Algonquin Park without knocking an easel over somewhere. Where would the tradition of Canadian writing be without that basic struggle, human versus nature? Not human versus where can I find a good parking spot? Now, where do people go to refresh themselves? They usually go, you know, to think creatively, to plan, someplace rural. I mean, we go to the city to eat and play and stay up way too late. But if we want to think, we tend to go to rural. Rural is where you learn to do things for yourself, where you learn to tell your own stories because nobody else is going to do it for you. For example, where are three of the newest radio stations in this province? Burnt Island, Norris Point, Hi. and uh, Bell Island. All rural communities, all run by rural communities, telling their own stories in their own way, taking over fire halls and cottage hospitals, schools to tell their story. They're not waiting for McLean's or Globe and Mail to stumble across them. How many places produce a weekly television show like in Burgio, This Week in Burgio? on the community-owned and community-controlled Virgil broadcasting system. The necessity to tell your own story has resulted in some innovation in communications in rural communities. I mean, even Facebook is used. If you go to Conch on the Northern Peninsula, it's a Facebook community. They have uh, groups that hold together the people who live in Conch still and the people who have moved elsewhere to make a life elsewhere. Conch. Conch is not really an outport anymore. Conch is a net port. Now, often we think of rural as being not particularly socially progressive. But what were the first ridings that elected female members of parliament in Canada? Were they the urban ridings? Were they supposedly the site of innovation? No. Gray County, Ontario, place of farmland, stony fields, elected Agnes MacPhail, re-elected her three more times. Agnes MacPhail worked on things from her rural beginnings, worked on things like a world disarmament, pensions for seniors, founded the Elizabeth Fry Society. She also was the first member of the Ontario legislature who was a woman and started uh, developing the first equal rights legislation in Ontario, passed in 1951. The Canadian Bill of Rights, the first Canadian Bill of Rights was developed under Prime Minister John Diefenbaker, born in rural Ontario, Newstead, Ontario, grew up in rural Saskatchewan. He started thinking about this in 1946. Finally became law in 1960s. Through, throughout the 1940s and 1950s, it was this feisty rural lawyer who was arguing for anti-discrimination legislation. His city colleagues were too busy with real estate deals, I guess. I don't know. But why don't we think of rural as being innovative? Because one reason, I think, is that rural has low self-esteem. It's on the couch. It's almost down for the count. It's been told so long it's not where it's at or where it's to that uh, it's actually come to believe it, sadly. And generations of kids have been told by their parents, get an education, get out while you still can. And they have. And the adults look around and they say, where is everybody that we told them to leave? When nobody pays much attention to you, you start to feel invisible. And rural is kind of like that member of the family that never quite gets in the Christmas letter. Have I mentioned that my core argument is that the uh, skills and innovations we developed in our rural communities are what we need to survive? Did I? I did. Okay, good. Thanks. I was checking. But let me complicate the issue a little bit here because that's the job of a university professor after all. Uh, those living in cities or in civilization actually benefit from rural's poor self-image. For example, as consumers, we benefit from the strong ties that people have to particular rural ways of life and to the land. Urban dwellers benefit from the willingness of farmers 
to, uh, and fishers and other uh, producers of raw materials to, to work hard, to endure risk, just to make a living possibly. There's this old joke we used to tell. This farmer won the lottery, won a couple million dollars. And they asked him, what are you going to do with it? He said, well, I guess I'll farm until it's gone. And we used to laugh at that, not because it was absurd, but because it was possible. Because farming, like many other things, is a habit. And many farmers, in order to feed their habit, end up working off the farm to subsidize their habit. When was the last time you heard an investment counselor say, I'd be doing this even if I wasn't paid? Or when did you hear an insurance executive say, you know, I have to work on the snow plows all winter just to subsidize my insurance business, but that's all right. There's this whole category of farmers in Statistics Canada that are called hobby farmers. And they produce surplus food, oh yes, but apparently they do it only as a hobby because they don't make enough to be self-sufficient. I mean, are there, are there hobby accountants? Are there hobby defense lawyers? I don't think so. Many of the farms in Canada that put food on the bistro tables in the cities are supported by off-farm income. So it's rural people going broke, working two jobs, even as they sustain cities, civilization. Is there any wonder why sometimes there's a bit of discontent out in the countryside? But the cities aren't about to help rural folks with their self-esteem because it's, it's really not in their interest to do so because cities are hooked on cheap food and they're hooked on cheap fuel and they're hooked on good clean water that's cheap. Now people need to have an identity. They need to have a sense of tradition, continuity. They need to be able to value their place within that pattern. And the anthropological literature is full of examples of people who have lost a sense of identity or it's been torn from them. I think we need a rural pride movement. I mean, can you imagine a bunch of people marching down the street yelling, we're here, we're rural, we're not going anywhere, and you owe us punctuating their chants with the fists in the air and then going into the church hall for tea and cards. Now, I'm not even going to talk about the fact that cities are not sustainable. Without natural resources, food, air, water, so on and so forth, uh, you know, your condo in the burbs is worthless. Now, I know they grow food in cities. I went to a conference last summer in downtown Toronto and uh, it was all about urban agriculture summits and we saw lots of reclaimed parking lots and we saw uh, you know, uh, people with companion chickens in their yard and so on, it was very exciting. And the way people talked about it, it was like they had just come up with this idea of growing food themselves. You know. But even if you've got a city that is at the best peak of production, they're using all of the resources possible, so they've got a, a row of carrots in every bit of soil They've got a basil plant in every windowsill. They've got a Jersey cow in every front yard. They might make 20% of what they need to survive. So a city is sustainable, yes, if you want to live on 400 calories a day, not have any food or fuel, you know, and uh, drink rainwater and uh, throw away your smartphone because you won't have the metals to make them. I mean, without rural, urban is not sustainable, obviously. I mean, can you sustain a place like Vancouver, even if you changed all the grow up into, you know, tomato and cucumber joints? No, it's impossible. <laughs> but rural can't save civilization unless we value it again as well, unless we take it to its rightful place, unless the cities stop riding on the backs of rural communities. I mean, the shift in rural is kind of seen, interestingly enough, on the backs of our money. Uh, as the queen has aged, the pictures on the backs of our money have changed from rural pictures to urban pictures. And who, who the heck knows what's on the back of our $20 bill, the new one. But as we get even further from reality, we're going to see pictures on the back like, like traffic jams and rows of condominiums, you know, at, at strip malls or something like that. And now I know we maybe need to have cities. We need some place for office workers to go between their shifts some place that kind of replicates the habitat that they are in in their office. And after, after a difficult day of dealing with memos and so on, who really wants wide open spaces and who really wants streets without lights, right? But sometimes a city is seen as livable only in as much as it starts to replicate a rural community, some sort of access to nature, 
some sort of a sense of belonging, a sense of community, moving toward some kind of sustainability. So we better start appreciating what rural provides for us, what it gives to us, and build that self-esteem before it's too late. So I want, I want you all to say it with me now. Just you may close your eyes if you want. We're going to just center ourselves, uh, breathe deeply, empty the mind of chaos, turn off the neural traffic. And let's just say rural will save civilization. Okay, let's try with this. Rural will save civilization. That's not very hard to accept it. Okay, one more time. Okay. Rural will save civilization, and civilization will thank you. Thanks. Happy trails.